Well, good morning, everybody. We're going to talk about numbers. Numbers are really important in programming because literally the only thing a computer can do is manipulate numbers. Everything else that we think that they do are a consequence of that, that we can map information in various ways, but fundamentally it all comes down to bits representing numbers. And those numbers do not work the way most of us think they work. And not understanding what's actually happening in our computations can affect the quality of our work. And so it's an interest, a useful thing to review this every once in a while. So we'll start with what mathematics tells us about numbers. We'll start with the natural numbers. These are sometimes called the whole numbers or the counting numbers. You know, one, two, three, and so on to infinity. There's still controversy as to whether or not zero is a natural number. I, I would have thought that they'd figured this out a long time ago. The correct answer is yes, zero is a natural number. But there's still a lot of textbooks that say the first natural number is one. And the name natural number is wrong, right? Because numbers do not exist in nature. Numbers are something that we use to model nature and other things. We drive them. You can't go outside and find a number anywhere. They don't exist. So saying that some numbers are natural implies that all the other numbers are unnatural. They're all unnatural in that respect. So this name just doesn't make sense. This only works for the numbers that we consider to be positive, but we also discover that there are numbers that are negative, and when we add these two sets together, we get the integers. And it took a long time to figure integers out. Uh, there were European mathematicians who for centuries argued that negative numbers are absurd. They are absurd numbers. They don't make any sense. They don't exist. They're not natural. Uh, they're wrong. That an equation that contains a negative number is invalid. It doesn't make sense. It's the same as dividing by zero or, or other sorts of tricks you might try to do in algebra. It doesn't work. And, you know, there were earlier mathematicians who figured out that they do work. Um, the Indians and the Persians and the Arabs and Fibonacci came back and said, yeah, well, you can do things with negative numbers. But they really didn't catch on in Europe until the calculus. Turns out the calculus loves negative numbers. And there are a lot of things that you can't do with the calculus unless you embrace ne negativity. So finally, negative numbers become possible and we get integers. Um, then there, there's a whole other class of numbers that are revealed by division. And these are called the rational numbers. And the name is a really good one, but it's confusing. We, we think rational means well, it's logical or it makes sense. And that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the ratio of two integers. And that's a brilliant way of expressing a whole range of numbers which cannot be represented by a single integer. Uh, so there are other numbers which are irrational, and that doesn't mean they're unreasonable or, or anything like that. It just means that they can't be represented as one number divided by another. And there are classes of these, including the algebraic numbers and the transcendental numbers. Most of the transcendental numbers are most of the possible numbers, but most of them are unknowable or, or cannot be understood by humans, except for a few, like pi and E, Euler's constant, and the, the uh, golden ratio. There are a few transcendental numbers that are really important to us, but the rest of them are kind of out there. Collectively, all of these are called the real numbers, which is, again, the wrong name. It's sort of like natural numbers. You know, numbers aren't real. You can't, they're not, but, but they're useful. They might have been called the useful numbers, except there are other numbers which are different that are also useful, uh, which are sometimes called the imaginary numbers. These are numbers that contain the square root of minus one as a factor. And the name imaginary numbers comes from Descartes, who just didn't understand these things. And he gave them this name trying to disparage them, hoping that people would stop talking about them. Similar to how the Big Bang got named. Um, so Descartes was a brilliant mathematician. He was the guy who helped us to fuse geometry and algebra together, which was a huge advance. You know, we named the Cartesian plane after him, but he just couldn't figure these things out. Um, now, 
Gauss said, these aren't imaginary, we should give them a better name. And he suggested calling them lateral numbers, which I think is a great idea, and that's what I want to call them. And if you have a pair of numbers, which one is real and one is imaginary, you get what we now call a complex number, which again I think is a, an awful name. Because they're really not complex, it's just a pair of numbers. And if Descartes had understood this, he might have said, oh, you can, it's a pair of numbers, so you can plot them on my plane. So these are Cartesian numbers. You know, he, he could have taken credit for all that stuff. Instead, he argued against it. And we call them complex. And they're really not complex, it's just a pair. There are really complex things in mathematics. The complex numbers are not in that set. So uh, that brings us to computer numbers. So all of the sets of, of numbers that we have in mathematics that I just talked about, they are all infinite sets uh, with at least a couple definitions of what infinite means. They, they get really big. But computer numbers are not. Computer numbers are finite, which makes them fundamentally different. It turns out that most numbers cannot be accurately represented or exactly represented. And as a consequence, some of the fundamental laws of mathematics, including the associative law and the distributed law, don't hold. Uh, the laws only hold if A, B, and C, and all of, and the results, and all the intermediate products and sums are all exactly representable. If any of those numbers are not exactly representable, then the laws do not hold, and our reasoning about them is wrong. For example, you can add three numbers together in one order and add those same numbers together in another order and get different sums. That the order in which you execute or evaluate changes the result, which is mathematically absurd, but that's how computers can work. So on modern computers, we represent all of our numbers in binary, where each bit uh, gets multiplied by a particular power of two, and we add them all together, and that's the value of a number. Usually we omit all of that other stuff because it's noisy and complicated, so we just say we have these bits. And if you have eight bits, hello, if we have eight bits, as I've shown here, we can represent two to the eighth states. So we can have 256 states. And we're free to decide what those states mean. Those states could represent numbers, like the numbers between 0 and 255, or they could represent uh, characters, like ASCII characters, or they could represent instructions of a machine, or uh, a shade of gray, or anything that we want. The, you know, it's just whatever we want that to mean, it can't have more than 256 meanings. If we need more meanings, more states, then we just add more bits. And the standard on modern computers now is 64 bits. And I would have drawn this with 64 bits, but it's just too much work. So the examples are going to be in 8 bits. Now, going from 0 to 255 is enough to give us the positive integers, but it doesn't give us the negatives. So if we want to go negative, then we need to try something else. So one approach, this was the first approach, is called signed magnitude. And in signed magnitude, we pick one of the bits out of our word of bits. It's usually the most significant, but it doesn't have to be. And we say that's now the signed bit, and we'll give it a meaning. And that's also arbitrary. We can say if it's 0, it's positive. If it's 1, it's negative. And that works. Uh, and in fact, it's very similar to the way we write numbers on paper. Another approach is one's complement. In one's complement, we represent a negative number by taking all of the bits in the word and flipping them. Um, but there's a, a complication if we do an add, and if the add carries, which means one of the bits falls off the top end, we do an end around carry, which means we take that bit before it falls in the bit bucket and add it back in at the low end of the word, and that gives us the final result. Most machines now use two's complement. Uh, same idea, except we flip all of the bits and then add one immediately. We don't wait for the add case. Uh, and, and that works, and all of our machines do that. One problem with all of these 
is that we get one extra value that we'd, we'd like to get 256 things or two, 255, well, there's the problem with zero. So with sign magnitude, we get two zeros. We get the original zero and negative zero. And mathematics teaches us zero is not signed. That makes no sense. Turns out in computer systems, zero is always signed. And it's usually positive. But in signed magnitude, there is also a negative zero. And we have to deal with that. In one's complement, there's a similar problem. If we take a zero and flip every bit, we get negative zero. And that can complicate things. In two's complement, it's a little bit different. We get minus 128. And this is problematic because we have a negative number for which there is no corresponding positive number. So the absolute value of minus 128 is minus 128, which sounds bizarre and probably is breaking some law of mathematics. And yeah, it's a problem. But that's how ints work. Every int will have this weird value which completely misbehaves. Now, in my view, the correct thing that we should do in hardware with these cases is take that extraneous value and use that to represent an error. It could be an overflow or a division by zero or some other thing which means there's nothing here. And it should be a toxic thing so that if we have this extra value as an input into something, guaranteed the output is going to have that so that we can get protection from bad things which could happen, such as overflow. What happens if we try to put too many bits into a number? What happens is we discard the most significant bits, the most important bits, the most valuable bits, and we don't tell anybody. If you want to maximize <coughs> the possibility of errors, this is how you do it. And it's really problem, uh, problemsome because this is the sand that we build all of our architectures on. That we can have these numbers that can go wildly wrong at any time with no warning, no indication. <coughs> and we're trying to do really important stuff. And we're undermined by the fundamentals of the way computer numbers work. So <coughs> that's it. <a coughs> So that's what happens with the integers, but what if we want the real numbers? Well, we can't, we can approximate the real numbers in a couple of ways. The most popular is with floating point. In floating point, we represent a number as a pair, sort of like the complex numbers, except instead of one dividing the other, one is a source of bits, the, the, the significant part of the number, and the other is where to position the binary point in that number. So by having that pair, we can approximate most of the real numbers. So you can imagine a perfect computer word, a word that contains an infinite number of bits, and it can contain all possible numbers. So it has a binary point at the middle, and we have bits going out in that direction all the way infinitely number of bits, which means we can represent all of the integers, which is great. Every integer can be represented in this without any limitation. But even better, the bits also go this way forever, which means we can represent all of the real numbers, including the transcendental numbers. So in this scheme, if you have infinite memory, you can exactly represent pi, which is really cool. Except this is impossible because you cannot buy an infinite number of bits. Bits are really cheap right now. You've got gigabytes of RAM in your pocket. I mean, they're really cheap, but you cannot buy enough memory with all the money in the world to represent pi exactly. It's just, you can't do it. It's impossible. It will never be possible. So we fake it, right? We can't get the, the real thing, so we fake it instead. So what we do, we, we can't have an infinite field the best we can have is a finite field. And the size of this field is going to depend on the floating point format. For the one we use in JavaScript or doubles in Java, it's a thousand or so bits. But you don't get all of those bits either. Instead, we've got a window. 
and we can scroll that window around on, on here. And the size of the window is also determined by the floating point standard. In JavaScript, it's about 53 bits. So we've got this window that we can move around that will contain all of the significant bits. And we can put it anywhere on that line, but you only get those bits. All of the bits that are outside of your window are interpreted to be zero. Okay, so that means if there are a bunch of interesting ones over here, those get lost. Those get truncated from your number. And that loss can cause errors, so, and errors can accumulate. So as a, a result of this necessary lack of precision, which is a fundamental aspect of all floating point systems, every operation could potentially lose up to half a bit of significance per operation and that could accumulate. You know, so you find more and more noise being inserted into your number. So you think you're doing lots of careful cal calculation, but it might turn out that over time, the least significant bits are getting corrupted and eventually, if you compute long enough, you might lose sense of everything. So there are mitigations for that. One is very, very careful coding, making sure that you, under, you do the numerical analysis so that you understand what the likelihood of losses are going to be and ordering the operations correctly so that you tend to add similar sized things, not try to add a small thing to a large thing because that increases the likelihood of error. But there's another approach that I really like called interval arithmetic. And this was really popular in the 50s and 60s. The idea is that instead of trying to represent a number as a single number, because we already saw that doesn't exactly work. We represent it as two numbers, and that gives us a range. We know that it's no more than this one, but no less than that one, and so it's somewhere in there. So if we can't exactly represent a number, we'll represent the range. It's somewhere in there. Uh, and that works. So this is an example of an ad routine that, that you might write. So. Uh, we're going to have an object that contains an upper value and a lower value. We know the truth is somewhere in the middle. And we'll make a, a new object in which we tell the floating point unit, give us a rounded down result. Usually they'll try to round to closest, but you can ask it to round it down. And we'll also ask for rounding up the, the larger components. And what will tend to happen over time is the range keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And if you're not coding carefully, understanding how floating point can lose precision, it can get bigger really fast. And at the end of the day, you find you're that. So you're guessing the truth is here plus or minus that, which could be really embarrassing. You know, we're, we're trying to tell people, you know, we're getting these results and they're really, really fuzzy. And I think that's why this is not popular because <laughs> Nobody wants to know the truth. So instead, we say, that's the number we got. The computer said it's good, so we're done with that and we'll move on. Nobody wants the truth. So that's OK, except when we start doing decimal arithmetic. Because the problem with these binary formats is that they cannot exactly represent the decimal fractions. And that's a problem because we live on a planet that uses the decimal system. And in particular, we use decimal fractions to represent money. And when you're adding up people's money, they have a reasonable expectation you're going to get the right sum. And we can't do that. So 0.1 plus 0.2 is not exactly equal to 0.3. And I think this is absurd. Even more absurd than negative numbers. This is, this is inexcusable. We are in the 21st century. We are in the future. And we can't add three times together correctly. How is that possible? So let's look at what's going on here. In order to do that, we want to first deconstruct a floating point number and understand what's exactly going on. So uh, this is a deconstruct function written in JavaScript. So we can pass in a floating point number. And we're going to try to extract the sine, the coefficient, and the exponent of this number. So we want to be working in positive space because things get a little bit weird in negative space. So we'll, if it's negative, we'll set the sign to minus and get the absolute value of the coefficient. 
then if the number is finite and not zero, which you know, means it's gonna be an interesting number that we want to deconstruct, then we'll go through this process. First, we'll set the exponent to minus 1128, which is approximately the size of the field. And we'll go in a loop where we'll divide the coefficient in half on each iteration until we get to zero. Now, if you know anything about arithmetic, you know, well, that doesn't make any sense because every number can, that's not zero can be further divided going to infinity. But these are not, these are finite numbers. You, you can't get there. So eventually we're gonna run out of significance and it's gonna stop. What'll happen is it'll first be decrementing the exponent until it can't decrement the exponent anymore. Then it'll start shifting the coefficient and it will sh keep shifting it until all the bits are gone. And at that point it's zero. And because we've been counting the number of times we did that, we will now know what the exponent of the number is. We'll know where the window is. The next step is we have to figure out what's in the window. So we'll do that by adjusting the coefficient un until it's at the point where it's an integer and then we're done. We can make an object which contains all those stuff and then we can look at it. So if we pass 0 0.1 to the deconstruct function, it will return this object. It tells us that the sign is one because it's positive, that's fine. The coefficient is seven quadrillion or so. The exponent is minus 56. So if we do the math and multiply some quadrillion times two to the minus 56, well, if you do this math in JavaScript, it'll tell you it's 0.1 because it's lying to you. If, if, uh, in, in my book, I'll, I'll show you how to do this accurately, or if you go to Mathematica or any other professional math system, they will tell you that it is this wild number. I want to get out of the way. It's, it's a really big number, or, or there's a lot of digits in it. And it's not, a, JavaScript doesn't think it's approximately that. JavaScript thinks it is exactly that. So when you type 0 0.1 into your program, JavaScript goes, okay, chief, I know exactly what you mean. You want this, okay? Um, and so you see all these digits back there, but there are no bits there standing for those digits. What we're seeing is phantom significance. It's the beating, it's a more pattern of binary versus decimal. And because it can't exactly represent this thing we get this crazy expansion, which is meaningless, but it looks really significant. And so you can get a result and you see all of these digits and you go, wow, we are so precise. But there's, there's actually no precision going on here. So what's actually going on? Well, this seven quadrillion number, if we look at it in hex, it's one and then 9999. So what's happening is if you take one tenth in binary, it's similar to taking one third in decimal. You get a repeating fraction. And it wants to go 999 to the end of time, except it can't go because it's finite, so we only get that many. So at the end, it drops off, and the decision has to be made, are we gonna round down by truncating, or are we gonna round up by adding one? In this case, it added one because that's the closest result. And so the last nine turns into an A. And that's what we get. So you can round up and be too big or you can round down and be too small, but you cannot get the right answer. You can't do it. So if the inputs are only approximate, then the result might be imprecise, which is a problem, particularly when you're dealing with money because it is a crime to pay approximately what is owed. It is a crime to report incorrect results to the government. So every number literal in your program with a decimal point is likely to contain a small error. Every number that you read from a database that was stored with a decimal point is likely to contain a small error. This should be freaking you out. Is anybody at all annoyed by this? I'm really annoyed by this. So why, why aren't you aware of this? It's because of the brilliant job that the floating point text conversion does. Uh, the algorithms that do that, that are built into your programming languages, need to be correct, optimal, and unsurprising. And so they are working really, really hard to conceal what's actually happening. 
And we're glad for that because we don't want to show what's really happening to our clients. We, we're, we're all in this conspiracy. Nobody knows how these numbers actually work. On top of, of being difficult, these algorithms are also computationally very expensive. And so if you look at JSON processing, the slowest thing about JSON processing is dealing with the numbers. And it looks like that should be the most trivial part of it, but that's, that's the only part that's expensive. The rest is trivial. So um, how did we get here? Well, the, this isn't JavaScript's fault. It's not even Java's fault. Most programming languages designed in the last 40 years have exactly this problem, and it's because of Intel. Intel designed this thing. They had a project called the 432, which was uh, a failed project. They were trying to build a micro mainframe before that was a feasible thing to do. The only thing that survived from that project was the floating point unit, which they uh, salvaged and sold in the market as the 8087, which is a coprocessor for the 8086. And uh, it was I think kind of an awful thing, but it led to a floating point standard and everything today uses that standard. And there's some people who say, well, that's great. You know, Intel knows what it's doing. You know, if, you know, their whole business is making things that do arithmetic, so we should assume that this is the best that we could do and, and not question it. Except in, Intel is just like the rest of us. There's nothing magical there. And in fact, they make mistakes. Uh, anybody remember the Pentium? Yeah, the, the, the floating point division instruction in the Pentium uh, occasionally made mistakes, and not very often, but it made them. And when they were first reported, Intel said, yeah, we knew about that, but we expect in most programs it's only gonna happen nine in a billion times, so, you know, most of you aren't gonna notice, and, and if it does happen, you're not paying attention anyway, so, you know, get over it, as people say now. Um, Lots of jokes. Yeah, um, this, it, it became a, a huge scandal. Lots of jokes came out. I, my favorite was David Letterman's. So on, on the Late Show on CBS at the, from the Ed Sullivan Theater, he said, do you know what goes great with those defective Pentium chips? Defective Pentium salsa. <laughs> so in the end, Intel had to buy the chips back, you know, so you could return them and exchange them for a good one. So what did they do with all of those defective chips? They made key rings out of them. <laughs> I bought this one on eBay. So just because it comes from Intel doesn't necessarily mean that, yeah, that's the last word on how we should be doing that. So there are some mitigations for these problems, uh, scaling, uh, binary coded decimal, rational numbers, and decimal floating point. And they all work to various degrees of satisfaction, so let's look at all of them. The first is scaling, this is the easiest one. Um, so integers in JavaScript are accurate to about nine quadrillion. As long, long as you're less than nine quadrillion and you're in integer space, you're good. And the laws of mathematics hold, so that's great. So, but dollars are not integers, but we can make them integers. So we can multiply our dollars or euros by 100, that turns them into cents, whole cents, those are integers, we can add them and get the right answer, so that's good. But you have to be ruthlessly consistent in doing this. You can't be a little unsure, you can't forget to have scaled something. At the end, when you're writing checks, you can't forget to unscale something. You have to put the decimal points back in when you show them to people. You know, you're off by two orders of magnitude if you get this wrong. And in a financial system, that can be devastating. Okay, so this works, but it's, it's scary, right? It's, stuff can easily go very, very wrong. Another approach is binary coded decimal. This was really popular in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's sort of fallen out of favor. The idea is that you represent a digit as a four-bit pattern, and that totally works. Um, there's a, a, a variation of it which says you represent three digits with a 10-bit pattern, but it's basically the same idea. And we can represent all the decimal fractions exactly in this scheme. Um, it, you, Intel chips used to have uh, BCD instructions. 
ABCD add and subtract and support for multiplication and division. Those instructions were all removed recently when they went to the 64-bit architecture. So those are gone because it's not very popular. People don't like doing that. So apparently that's not an option. I don't know why, because it works. It, back in the mainframe era, when you bought your mainframe, you buy the optional floating point unit or, or the optional BCD unit, and then your COBOL programs would do the right thing. Another approach is rational numbers. Rational numbers are great. You know, we, we saw those earlier. You've got two integers and you do the ratio. And for some applications, they're really nice in that you don't have to do division. You just do inversion, which is really cheap. You're just flipping two numbers over. And for some applications, it goes really fast. And the results are exact, that we can represent all of the rational numbers up to some range using this format. But um, we want to use big integers in doing this because ordinary integers can't hold enough range. So here's how we might do an addition using rational numbers. Uh, you know, we multiply uh, one numerator and denominator and add to that the multiplication of the other numerator and denominator and that gets us a number. Uh, there are some optimizations we can do on this, like if we notice that both of the denominators are the same, then we don't have to do the multiplications, we can just add the numerators. But in general, you're going to have to do this most of the time. And the problem is that these denominators can get really big. They grow really fast. And so you need big ints, because if you're using ordinary ints, they'll overflow really quickly. And you might, at that point, try to re reduce the fraction to make it simpler. But that might not work. You might just be at the point where it needs to get bigger. And eventually, they get so big that it, even as fast as computers are today, it just becomes infeasible, which is a shame. Now, you can cheat at the point where you they start getting ridiculously big, you might say, okay, we will uh, reduce as much as we can and then we'll do a hard division in order to find a, a cheaper approximation of the value. But at that point, we've lost the benefit of that being exact and that was the whole point. So I would really like these, except uh, for most applications, they're not practical. Although for some applications, they're exactly what you want. They can be really good. So I think that the most useful of these is decimal floating point. And conceptually, this is really simple. All we do is change the basis from 2 to 10. So instead of a significant times 2 to an exponent, it's times 10 to an exponent. Ta-da. And if we do that, we can now exactly represent all the decimal numbers. Exactly, which is exactly what we want. Um, and also, it better supports our intuitions. For example, if we get, we still can't get all the digits that go off to the extreme, but we don't need them now, because we'll see there are zeros. That, you know, if people are talking about really big numbers, usually they're talking about how many zeros are in the number. When numbers get to be too big to understand, we assume that it's all zeros off to the end. And that's how these work. So if we get a huge result and we, then we see lots of zeros at the end, we know what that means. We know that we're looking at an approximation. We don't have the phantom significance, which is trying to tell us that there's something there when there isn't. So we're less likely to be confused by these numbers. We're immune from phantom significance. And also the text conversion is much, much faster, much more accurate. It's almost trivial. So my proposal on this is something that I came up with called DEC64. It's a modern decimal floating type. And I recommend that DEC64 be the only number type in all uh, application languages from here on out. Having multiple number types in a language creates opportunities for picking the wrong type, which leads to errors. If there's only one type which does everything correctly, programming is simpler, and there are a class of errors that can be avoided the sorts of errors which have blown up spaceships and, and other calamities. Um, and in a hardware implementation, these integers can be added in a single cycle, which means that the excuse for why we need ints goes away. There's no performance argument anymore. These will run just as fast in that case. 
So these numbers work the way that humans think numbers work, which is good. It eliminates numerical confusion, which reduces errors. Conversion of DEC64 numbers to text and back is simple, efficient, correct, and unsurprising. And it can represent decimal fractions up to 16.3 digits, which is quite a lot of digits. Uh, most applications can live very easily in that space. There are some in numerical analysis, in uh, physics and astronomy where maybe you need more, but for most of what we're doing every day, this is more than enough range. So this is what it looks like. It's a very simple representation. It's a 64-bit word which contains a 56-bit coefficient and an 8-bit exponent. And the value of a number is that exponent uh, raised to the 10th power times the coefficient. Really, really simple. And there's, uh, there are two software implement, implement, implementations, uh, one for Intel X64 assembly language and one for ARM64 assembly language. So if any of you are working on the next language, I recommend that you pick those up. And eventually, if we can get enough adoption in software, we'll eventually get adoption in hardware. A software implementation of numbers is obviously going to be slower than a hardware one, but it's not too much slower for most numbers. So adding integers in this number format in software is five instructions, which sounds like five more than, or four more than you would get in the hardware implementation, except that you also get protection from overflow, which I think is a really valuable thing. So JavaScript has only one number type, which I think is great because there's a large class of errors that are avoided. The problem is it's the wrong type. It really should be decimal floating point Binary floating point was the only choice available at the time, but I think we've learned that it was the wrong choice. So most modern programming languages went the other way. They have a confusion of faulty number types. So in a typical language, you might see int int 60, or unsigned int 16 and signed int 16, 32, 64, float 32, float 64, float 64. You should never use float 32. It just doesn't have enough resolution. The errors I was talking about, they happen much faster in this one because you just don't have enough bits. The 64 has enough bits that you might be immune in most applications, but this one is really weak. And what's concerning is that there are proposals floating around now for float 16, which has even fewer bits. And my concern is if this gets out into all the hardware, there are idiot coders who will go, 16, that's going to go really fast, and, and they're going to do a lot of that. Um, the motivation for the float 16 is for doing AI, that the neural nets are slow, and so they're trying to figure out how to compute them. And in those applications, they don't care about the quality of the results because nobody understands how they work anyway. So, <laughs> you know, we're off by how much. How can anybody tell? We don't even know what the thing does. It's just so. Uh, you have a question? Yes, if, if you introduce a new format, as you're saying, how would you deal with the fact that databases have formats that you might have to deal with the old formats? Yeah, how do we deal with the old formats? Um, I think JSON is the solution to that. So we, we can convert that stuff into decimal text and then move it so that we'll, through JSON, we can have the new languages talking to the old languages. Jason can be the bridge to a better tomorrow. So um, in most of our languages, unfortunately, they don't have these names, because these names make it easy to understand what each of these represents. Instead, they have names like these. You got byte, char, short, and long, float, and double. And you know, who knows? You know, the names aren't descriptive at all. The names are all very different, but they're all representing basically the same idea. They just look odd. Um, and it means when you're programming in this, every time you're going to create a new property or a new parameter or a new variable, you have to go, which one? And if you pick the right one, then hooray. And if you pick the wrong one, your program is going to fail in a way that the tests cannot find because the tests all assume that 
the types are, are correct. And the type system, type system is actually going to make things worse. So an example of that, in Java, if you search for a substring in a string and it can't find it, it really should report null. Null is the right answer. This doesn't make any sense. Instead, it, the type system won't allow it to do that, so it returns minus one. So if you put this in the middle of a formula, it, expecting that it's always going to find something and it doesn't, it's going to look like it found something but in the wrong place. And that could be really bad and the type system does not help you in identifying those sorts of bugs. Uh, JavaScript has a much better type system than Java, so JavaScript could have returned null in this case. Unfortunately, it chose to copy what Java did for no good reason. I guess because it's an industry standard or something, but it did the wrong thing because it was the standard behavior. So let's have a quiz. So the question is, int32 plus int32, what is the result type? Any guesses? Did I hear int32? Oh, you're close. The correct answer is int33. <laughs> int33 is the right answer because it, if, if you look at it, Anytime you do an addition, there's a chance you're going to end up with one more thing than you started with. You know, if you add one and one in binary, you can get one zero, right? That's two bits, and so it can grow. Now, for those of you who said 32, Java agrees with you. Uh, Java also got it wrong. So let's try another one. In 32 times in 32. What's the correct answer? In 64? Oh, you're close. It's in 63. In 63. You were thrown off by the sign bits. It, you didn't count for the sign bits. But yeah, it's in 63. But you did much better than Java. Java is way, way off. So the problem here, obviously, is that um, we're get, we overflow. Right? That if you end up generating 33 bits, which you will in the worst case, or 63 bits it, when doing the multiply, all those bits are thrown in the bit bucket and are not reported to you. And the program will continue as though it was written correctly. Yeah? Uh, so if you will multiply the bits that go on to the bits that go, you will get in 63 of them. If you fulfill the multiplication, you will get more. I'm sorry, what? So if I multiply uh, in the 32, we will get in 63, and then in 63, we multiply in 63, we will get uh, 124, I can't. And it will grow fast? I, I can't do numbers that big in my head. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've been programming too long. When I was a kid, I was really good at arithmetic. I, I, I could do stuff in my head. But adding two numbers is a skill that I've lost over time because I just ask the computer and it's... Did anyone else experience that? Has, has, have your math skills? Yeah, They're very, very common. Sorry, I'm, I'm sure what you were saying probably made sense, but I, I can't verify it. Yeah, well, the, you'll approximately double if you're adding numbers that are similar in magnitude. Okay, so um, so overflow is bad, right? Uh, so because the most important part of the result is gone, and you're left with this stuff, and there's no easy way to look at that result and know that this bad thing happened, and there can be tragic consequences from this. Uh, the uh, 737 is big in the news, so but we don't exactly know all the things that went wrong there. But there was an earlier incident with the 787 Dreamliner which is a beautiful airplane. I really enjoy flying on that airplane, even though they found this bug in it. So the FAA reported that if the four main generator control units were powered up at the same time, after 248 days of continuous power, all four GCUs will go into fail-safe mode at the same time, resulting in a loss of all AC electrical power regardless of flight phase. Okay, and that's because they had a real-time clock variable that was an int32. The real-time clock was updated 100 times a second. 
and after 206, 243 days, it rolls over. And the controller software would see, yikes, we've jumped almost two years backwards in time. This doesn't make any sense. Something's terribly wrong. Shut down. You could be in flight when that happens. Okay? And when that happens, there's no way to land the plane. That, so, um, yeah, someone went, I'll pick an N32 for that. Uh, so the FAA's uh, allowed the planes to continue to fly, but issued an order that you had to turn the plane off and on every 120 days. <laughs> and in fact, you've observed stuff all the time where you turn it off and on and it works. You know, why does that work? Very often it's because of this. You've, you've got something which overflowed and put it into a bad state. Not bad enough to kill it, but enough to make it act unpredictably or undesirably. And if you turn the power off and on, suddenly it seems okay. So this happens all the time, occasionally in, in places where it can kill a lot of people. Fortunately, not always, or at least not that we're aware. So as long as we're, we don't know what's going on, we're pretty happy. But I, I think this stuff is pretty bad. Now, had that programmer picked or, uh, an int 64 to represent the real time, uh, you could go like three trillion years before this, or no, three billion years before this is a problem. And I, I think that's probably okay. I, I, I think life on this planet will be extinct long before we get to that point, so it's okay. But and if we're still around, and I hope we are, then someone just has to remember to turn it off and on. And <laughs> it will be all right. Now, had they written it in JavaScript, um, it would have a range of three million years, which is probably greater than the life expectancy of the plane, so that's probably okay. Not that I would recommend writing critical systems in JavaScript. <laughs> the, the language just has so many insecurities in it, I would be really worried about doing that kind of critical software in that language, or any of our languages. Um, I'd be much happier flying on a plane written in JavaScript than a plane written in C or Java. Uh, but you know, it's, it, I know how this stuff works. <laughs> it's really scary. Um, <laughs> so, um, so big ints have been proposed for JavaScript. Uh, and they might be in some future edition coming out soon. I think they were unnecessary. And the proof of that is I've got code there, a library on GitHub, which I describe in my book, where you can get big ints for free right now. Just load that file and you've got big ints. And they really work. And any integer that you've got enough memory for, you can represent exactly. And so. There's not a necessity argument for adding these to the language. There might be a performance argument, but most performance arguments are species, and, and I don't agree with those. I've heard it argued that big ints will solve the decimal problem, and they do not. They, they don't do anything to help solve the decimal problem. And I think adding a new number type to a language with only one does, language, or does violence to that language. Um, again, it introduces the problem, you know, which one do you choose? And we're going to see people choosing the wrong one in lots of different ways, not understanding fully what it's all about. So that brings us into the end. I just want to remind you that you should write programs that work well, that are free of error. <laughs> that's the job. That, that's what we're supposed to be doing. If you're not doing that, you're not doing it right. So thank you very much. And by the way, if you want to know anything more about numbers or anything else about JavaScript or everything, pretty much everything that's important today is, can be found in this book, which is available on Amazon. All right, thank you. Oh, and before we break up, let's see what, what time it is. Yeah, we've got about 10 minutes for questions, if anybody has a question. Yeah. Uh, 
Right, so you mentioned two problems. One is the Unix, Unix epoch. Um, Unix was, originally had a 32-bit real-time clock, um, and it, its epoch was uh, January 1st, 1970. And in a few years, I think we got 2038, it overflows. So if there are any 16-bit unpatched Unix systems still in existence at that time, they will fail in unexpected ways. Uh, so that's bad. Uh, and what was the other one? Oh, the, the Y2K bug, yeah. So the, the Y2K problem was due to, initially to punch cards. So in punch cards, you only had 80 columns to represent a field, and that was all. If, if you overflowed, you know, your application was junk and you had to start over. So in order to make that work, people shortened the years to two digits. And when we migrated from punch cards, people kept doing that. They were used to doing that. It's a, a very common thing in, in computing that something may have made sense once, but we continue to do it long after it stops making sense, and then it be, turns into a problem, and this was one of those. So they kept representing the year as two digits, and when we get to the year 2000, everything goes wrong. So that happened. Yeah, so he's referring to the movie Office Space, which I highly recommend. It's a great movie. Um, and, and he didn't mention this, but Silicon Valley, I think, is also a, a great TV show. If, uh, it's the best show ever made about programming. Uh, you, definitely, you should pay HBO. Don't steal HBO. Buy it to, to see Silicon Valley. They got the next season is starting next week or soon. It's wonderful. Um, also in Superman 3, that was one of the plots there as well, that, that uh, someone accumulated the rounding error on all the decimal arithmetic and accumulated a huge amount of money. I, 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 th I think uh, there are watchdogs that are looking out for that stuff now, so that it's probably not a great opportunity if, anymore. Uh, anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, he's saying, it, is it, isn't it a little unfair to be complaining against Intel? Because we had floating point before, and that's absolutely true. We had lots and lots of different floating point formats. Um, every manufacturer had their own format, and sometimes even different models within the same manufacturer had their own format. And what Intel did was standardize us all on one bad format. So. They didn't create the problem, but they turned it into a standard. And the problem with having a, a standard be that becomes adopted that ferociously is it prevents further innovation. And so that's the thing that I'm annoyed at Intel for, that they uh, didn't create the problem, but they made it very difficult to fix the problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so th they could patch it. They could, um, if you've got the Unix source code, you can find the real-time clock variable and change it into an int64, and, and now you're good. Um, anybody who's still running 32-bit unpatched Unix, it's probably the case that we don't know how to generate 
patches for those machines anymore, that that information has been lost, or we might not even have access to the machines. They might have been built into systems, into larger systems, and sealed, and there's no way to get at them. We don't know where these things are. Like maybe it might be controlling a nuclear power plant, say, and it's in a part of the plant that you can't get to. And it's been forgotten. Nobody knows that that machine is still online. Probably not a problem, but, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's predicting that the next calendar problem is going to be 2100 when uh, errors in leap code algorithms are exposed. Um, my feeling on that is we should replace the uh, leap year algorithm. So instead of the 400, 400 thing we have now, we have the 4128 system. Um, I, I have no optimism that we're ever going to do that, but. I would really like to see us do that. As a programmer, we do something every four years except every 128 years just resonates with me. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's perfect, but um, well, not perfect. If it were perfect, you know, my, my argument against intelligent design is that if there had been intelligent design, the number of days in a year would be an integer. <laughs> And it's and not. Power of, two. <laughs> power of two would have been nice, but I would have accepted a decimal year. Uh, but just not anything with a fraction and not a weird fraction. And what do you think about quantum computers? What do I think about quantum computers? I don't know yet. I mean, the possibilities look to be really interesting. Um, I don't know that they're going to get them to the level of quality that we need in order to do stuff predictably, but you know, we've done it, we did it with bits, maybe we can do it again. I, 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 uh, it, it doesn't fix the decimal problem. <laughs> yes? Uh, that's an approach, and uh, as I was saying before for uh, uh, the, the rational arithmetic, that's how you have to do it because the denominators can get so big. A, a bounded denominator will cause the format to fail, and so you need to have big ints. And the problem becomes one of performance then, that you're spending so much memory and so much time dealing with that, that garbage collection overhead can overwhelm uh, the speed of computation. All right, anybody else? Yes? So your proposal for the solution to this problem, what is your current confidence in the momentum of that idea? Do you, is that, do you realistically something you can see happening? Yeah, so what's my confidence in getting DEC64 to, to actually happen? So. I have a little bit of experience with convincing the whole world to do the right thing. You know, <laughs> you know that. Um, I don't know that I can do it again. You know, it's quite an audacious thing to say you can convince everybody in the world to finally do the right thing. Um, that turns out to be really hard. Except I don't have to convince everybody in the world. I only have to convince the man or the woman who designs the next language. If I can convince that genius that they should make a language with only one number type, a type that will compute things correctly for humans, that humans can manage, and if that language is successful, that will drive the rest of it. You know, the thing that drove Jason was uh, it worked really well for web applications. So when the Ajax revolution happened in 2005, suddenly there was this huge flood of people into the web space for the first time. And they were being told by W3C, and you have to use XML. And they looked at that and said, to hell with that, what else can we do? 
and oh, this JSON, that looks easy. Okay, let's do that. And that drove that, and then that drove everything else. So if you can find one application which uh, becomes influential, then that can move the rest of it. And so I think for DEX64, that's gonna be the next language. Because I'm confident there's gonna be a language after JavaScript. Because if JavaScript is the last language, that would be really sad. <laughs> you don't wanna leave JavaScript for your kids, right? That, that's, no, that's no legacy. For the kids, you know, let's make a better language for the kids, for the children. Yeah, it, it is better than basic. Yeah, all right, well thank you very much.